interviewer. Shoot, Ben. Interview. Interviewer, please state your first and last name. Benjamin Dush, B-E-N-J-A-M-I-N-D-U-S-H. Uh, the date is October 29th, and it is filmed at the National Atomic Testing Museum. What is your name, and please spell them, and then your birthday. Okay, now you have to speak up oh, because my ears aren't so, working too uh, well. What is your name? Uh, my name is Irvine L. Phillips. And how do you spell that? I-R-V-I-N-E. Kind of like that city in Southern California, but no relation. Uh, L for Lewis, and last name is Phillips with two L's, P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S. And your birth date? Uh, birth date, uh, 27 February, 1932. Okay. And we're going to start with the questions. Did you serve in the military, and if so, when and where? Okay, I, yeah, I was in the military. I was in uh, active enlisted reserves from... Uh, shortly after the Korean thing started back in 1950. And then I was commissioned in 1953. So I had been, been enlisted in this uh, active army reserve unit. Uh, and then uh, I got my commission. I was discharged one day as a corporal uh, in, in the army reserves. And then I was commissioned the next day as a second lieutenant in the Army Corps of Engineers, and that was in, in, in uh, June of 53. What operations or shots were you present for? <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, this would be in the Teapot series, right, in 19, uh, spring of 1955. And I personally, with my, my company, uh, spent about seven months in Frenchman Flat, and there we were digging deep holes and emplacing, building uh, tests, or let's call it experimental underground bunkers. And then another portion of what we were doing, now again, we, there was one, just one 500-foot tower shot done at Frenchman Flat during that series. The rest of the shots, but whether they were tower or they were underground, were all done up at Yucca Flat. Frenchman Flat's just a small playa, maybe 10 miles in diameter. Yucca Flat runs from north of Indian Springs Air Force Base all the way up to Yucca Mountain. It's like 75 miles long. It's a huge place. So we had just the one, I was involved directly in just the one test. And the whole purpose of this thing, of course, was that uh, because the, the Navy and the AEC uh, collaborated in, in a series of, of maritime tests in the South Pacific years before, uh, the Army now got their chance with the AEC, and so this series, uh, the Teapot series, which of course was the spring of 55, uh, the Army was involved in, and in my particular, and it was involved in, in the form of the battalion to which I was signed, and that was the 95th Combat Engineer Battalion, Army level, which had just come back from Korea. And so our company, I was in Able Company, had the job, had the Frenchman flat job. And this involved, again, uh, digging deep holes and building experimental bunkers, or I guess you'd call them experimental shelters of all different kinds. We steel. Uh, I guess you'd call it steel corrugated covers and heavy timber covers and sheet steel covers and concrete and the whole works. And this was the, uh, the Army, of course, was, was concerned, as was the world, if you will, the, uh, the effects of nuclear detonations. And so this was the, what, one of the things the Army was concerned about. Can we build things that are going to survive nuclear detonations uh, underground? And then the other, the other big project that we had was at one half mile from ground zero and one mile from ground zero, uh, we were to, to dig wide trenches. And that at those two locations, that was 1,760 yards out and 3,520 yards out from ground zero. And the purpose of that was, the, was to emplace various pieces of equipment that the Army brought in that they wanted to, which 
they wanted to see how would sur how would these survive uh, a nuclear detonation. And we had old tanks and APCs, armored personnel carriers. You know, they're, they're armored places you can haul people around in. And they brought in old bulldozers and other sorts of heavy equipment. And we were to <clears throat> place some in the ditches and some up on the open ground. And then the Army provided us with these long steel stakes that had numbers built in about, about a foot or two down. And we were to place those stakes wherever something was in place and also on top of the entrances to these underground bunkers. So that afterward, uh, the, the troops that were evaluating this would come in with uh, glorified, uh, what do we call those things where you're going after, tra treasure, uh, treasure readers, you know? And then they would find these stakes and the number would indicate what had been there. And this was a very good thing because at, for example, after the, after the detonation, the, uh, oh, let's just say uh, a tank, maybe a, a, T, a T-51 or something, one of the heavy tanks would be parked at, say, a half a mile. And after things were over, you found the tank blown away from the location. And you found lots of pieces. And then when you got to a mile, the whole tank kind of remained, but it still rolled over several times. So the point of putting these stakes in was just to locate the various things that were being tested uh, so, so that afterward, the, the people that were determining the kind of results that, that happened were able to say, well, gee, this thing with this 55-ton tank, it rolled over 13 times uh, at a mile, and it rolled over in pieces farther than that at, at a half mile. So that, that was the primary purpose of the work we did, that my, my company, Company A, did uh, for the test. And that took us, geez, we were out there, we would go from, get up at five in the morning there at camp, now Camp Desert Rock was where we were in place. Or, and that was a tent camp that was halfway between the Highway 95 intersection with the road that went north to, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, to Mercury, and, and Mercury was the, was the city, well, it was a, the administrative center and the shops for the AEC's work at, at both Yucca Flat and Frenchman Flat. And as you guys, as you probably know, Frenchman Flat is one mountain range north of of the, the, the flat through which 95 goes and where uh, Mercury is and where Camp Desert Rock was. And then you drop into Frenchman Flat and, and that's probably about 35 miles or so north of, of uh, Mercury. And then you go over another range of mountains and drop into Yucca Flat. <clears throat> and Yucca Flat was where the majority of these tests were. And my company didn't have anything to do out there. Uh, Charlie Company, we had three companies in the, in, the, in the battalion, they were involved with digging lots of trenches at generally about a mile away from the ground zero from some of those, uh, those test, test towers. Or I think they also did that because they had some underground shots too. And the purpose of these trenches was, was that during the course of these tests, they were going to be bringing a lot of troops in. And the idea was that you would load these troops up, hard hats and all, we'd go into these six foot deep, two foot, two foot high trenches or two foot wide trenches. Get down there like this with our head, hard hats on. And then they'd set the thing off. And of course, we, this, this was so that, that, that uh, GIs could get a feeling for what it was like to be around a nuclear detonation. It's kind of exciting, and I'll get into that shortly. Uh, so our, our work actually, uh, we finished up at the time that our shot went off, which was sometime about late April, I think, early May. But as I remember, uh, Teapot had 
this is my memory now, Teapot had 14, was, was to have 14 nuclear detonations. And I remember at least 12, and I know that there was one in which a B-25 flew in, uh, a B-52 flew in from the east at something like 50,000 feet high, and they had a, a uh, one of these nuclear devices. Now, we didn't call them bombs, we called them devices. Uh, this thing was shot up into the stratosphere, and they had, of course, removed people from the actual uh, Yucca Flat, not not knowing whether the the uh, 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 the the vehicle that was going to shoot up to a hundred thousand feet to set this thing off would turn around and come back down again, but it didn't. It made it, got up to a hundred thousand feet. And the rest of us were down at Camp Desert Rock, so basically that was two, val two uh, valleys or playas south of this. But you know we could look off up there. Of course, you couldn't look at it. There were a couple of guys who had these very dark glasses, and they could. But you have to wait till the the first emission of light, and that because the emission of light from these things is huge. It's the brightest thing you'd ever seen. I mean, brighter than the sun. And then very shortly afterward, we were able to look up and way up there over, over Yucca Flat, you know, 30, 55 miles north of us, was a great big smoke ring. And that was all you saw from a nuclear detonation. Well, what, what, what's the normal uh, version that we would think of of, a, of an atomic unit or atomic bomb. Well, what is it? It's a mushroom cloud. Well, however, we didn't have a mushroom cloud because the thing went off up so high that there was no suction of soil and dirt and so forth up to make the stem of the mushroom. Of course, the top of the mushroom was the actual detonation. I think all those tires there, towers were something like 500 feet because the one that we worked out half a mile or a mile away from that we worked was uh, three-legged and it had steel this thick and it had three sets of guys, guy wires coming down and the cables were yay big around. They were attached to dead men that were buried in concrete on all three sides and they had one coming, one set coming down from the top, one halfway, a third of the way down and one two-thirds of the way down. And the interesting thing was that we were able, some of us, you know, in the unit were able to go back afterward, and, and of course we could get only just so close to ground zero, because they had an army signal unit there. We call them the blue, we call them the blue flag boys, because they would come out right after a shot, if you will, and they would come in there with their uh, scintillometers and Geiger counters, and they would get to the 300 rad level which is a, you know, a measure of radiation. <laughs> and then they'd put these little stakes, steel stakes with little blue flags, and you weren't supposed to go inside that because a, an acute 300, over 300 rad dose, they thought in those days, would, would be uh, an acute dose and not something you really wouldn't want. Well, remember now, this stuff was all done early in the game, and the whole purpose of these tests, the ones you know, blowing up uh, atolls and ships in the South Pacific and of course the tests, the, the land tests were for, for the AEC and for the Army, the Navy and so forth to learn about the effects of nuclear detonations because you know, not too much was known. Sure, they'd had, uh, they'd had the very first one in White Sands, then they had uh, Hiroshima and then they had the one the next day, or maybe it was the same day, I forget. Uh, this was back in uh, 45, I guess. Yeah, Nagasaki. And, and Nagasaki was, uh, one of those was fission and one was fusion, and I can't remember which. One was uh, a uranium-235 bomb, or the other one was a plutonium. But anyway, and that's all they'd had. That's all it was, you know, that's all it was actually done tactically or strategically. And so there was an awful lot more that they had to learn. And so we at Frenchman Flat had the one tower. 
And the army was assigned 180 degrees to the west to do whatever, I guess, we were supposed to do, by orders, of course. And then the AEC on the east 180 of, of, from the tower, they built a city. And they had buildings, and they had vehicles, cars there, and they had dummies. And I don't know, maybe all of us, I think, have had a chance to see on television one of those photographed shots, and that happened during when they set our, our unit off. Uh, and I guess they had a camera, and they had a house, and you're looking at the house, and all of a sudden, there's a big bright flash, and the, 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 and that's the initial detonation. And then the house begins to flame. I mean, in other words, there's, what, with that flash of light, there was a tremendous, I guess you'd call wave of heat, and that sets this house on fire. And here's the house beginning to blaze. And then wham, here comes a big old blast of wind from where the detonation was. Whew, goes right by, and the house starts falling apart and burning parts start going. And then, but that's not the end, because when that detonation takes off, there's a tremendous amount of heat. And so therefore it vaporizes everything. And I'll tell you about what our tower looked like when they finished with it. And so that forces a, a tremendous blast wave outward, upward, you know, in other words, 360, or, well, 360 degrees, except you got ground. And then, of course, all of that air that's been moved out has to come back. And so then you get a wave coming back. And by that time, the house was pieces, and there were pieces flying all over. But the, that was for publication. You'd see that on TV, and I've seen that probably three or four times in the last, well, 50 50 years? <laughs> yeah, 55 years. Uh, now, what, here's another. The, these trenches, of course, that Charlie Company took care of, uh, that is built out there in Yucca Flat, were always at least a mile away from a ground zero, from a tower or even from an underground. And so the trenches were, they would haul people out there, troops. And as I said, we'd get down inside those trenches. And some of us that were there full time, we had a chance to do that two or three times. But they'd bring in troops from all over the country. And they'd load them on in there and shove them on down in those trenches. And of course, the big shots, they were in the bunkers, the concrete bunkers right up behind where all of us uh, ground pounders were down in the trenches. And so th th this would be my impression of what it was like to be in one of those trenches. Would, would you like that? Yeah. Okay, so we get off the bus, and we, they line us up, they, they form us into a, a group, and then they line us up, and we file down into these trenches. They say, all right, you guys, you're going to hear the countdown, because it's coming from uh, loudspeakers up on the, I guess you'd call it on the, uh, uh, the, the concrete bunkers. And of course, the Anything over probably a major, he was back there, and then of course the AEC pros and so forth, and they had their dark glasses. Well, of course, we didn't have that. We're down in the trench like this on our knees. We've got our hard hats on, our steel helmets, and so we'd hear this 10, 9, you know, as we did earlier, and it would get down to zero, and then suddenly, and of course, what we were supposed to do is cover our eyes like this and keep them totally covered until the, the bright flash was over. So we'd hear one, two, one, zero, and then all of a sudden they would get so bright, the bottom of a six foot trench, two feet wide, like this, that you could almost see through your hands. I mean, you know, it just, everything you're, turned red. Well, of course, if you'd had your eyes open, you'd, had, you'd have had your retinas burned. So, so the first thing that we notice is this huge bright flash of light. And they said, and we're supposed to stay down there. She don't get up. You do not get up. Then the next thing, the ground starts jumping around. Well, of course, the, the blast wave moves faster through rock than it does through air. 
So the very first thing beside the flash is the ground. You're being thrown around the bottom of the trench, sort of like uh, ping pong balls in a, in, a, in a kino deal. And so we're down there. And then the next thing after the, that, there's this tremendous blast of, of, of warm air. And that follows because, of course, it's slower going through the air than it is through the ground. And so we're still down there. And so we were down there, and there's, you know, there's small pebbles and stuff are blowing in and dropping all over us. And then the, the, the instructions come out on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, the loudspeakers. Stay down until the back blast occurs. Well, what happens is all that air that moves out has to come back in again. You know, when they, the heat uh, from the uh, detonation uh, and from 500 feet starts pulling everything up. So by then we could stand up. Once the back wave was over, you can stand up and take a look. And we're looking over the edge of the trench. And so what do we see? Well, we see the beginning of the mushroom stem. All this stuff's being sucked up because this, the fireball has pretty well faded. In other words, it, uh, at the very beginning it was so white, so hot you couldn't even look at it. Then the color of the fireball kind of went to kind of a, of a, of a pale, well, whitish yellow, then kind of a yellow, then a gold, and then a kind of an orange, and it turned, began to red. And then by then there was a lot of brown smoke coming out. So you had this, this big boiling mass of smoke, and, the, and the, the colors are fading, and up it goes slowly. You're looking up at it. And the thought, thing that I thought was interesting was that once the mushroom shape, the stem, and the brown top, you know, by then the, 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 light, the, the, the light that occurred from the fireball has dissipated. And, and, and this was, of course, these were done in, in, uh, uh, in the, at the dawn, and it wasn't full light. It was generally fairly dark when this happened. And so then what we would see, would, you know, I saw this, this thing got up to probably 10 or 15,000 feet almost immediately, looking up at this brown, roiling, smoky brown deal with a, with a stem, which is, of course, soil and stuff being pulled up by the, the updraft. So this weird blue glow came out. You see it kind of seeping out through the clouds. So I, I talked to some folks afterward. And apparently, this was, uh, what do we call that? There's a certain amount of cobalt, I guess, in the makeup of the, of the device. And so the heat is so, so intense that it actually vaporizes this. And so what happens is you get incandescent, in, <laughs> incandescent gases which were metals before. And this, I guess, this incandescent, incandescent gas of, uh, of cobalt. This is what I was told by you know, some pro, at, I forget what it was. It's kind of blue. So that, that, that explained that. So it makes for a very interesting uh, experience. I'm sorry? Can you tell us what life was like at Camp Desert Rock? Can you describe that to us? At the, at, the, at the camp itself with the tents and everything that you were talking about earlier? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, yeah, oh, oh, you, well the camp, you mean the ones we were talking about that did the houses and so forth? No, well, the, the, you know, where Camp Desert Rock itself, so with the tents and things like that. Where oh, okay. Oh, yeah. oh, okay, yeah. Like, what does Ground Zero look like after you've set one of those off on top of a tower? Good point. Now remember now, this tower was made up of three legs, 500 feet tall. Looked kind of like a, uh, uh, a cell tower. But, and it was three legs, just like a cell tower. But the steel was yay thick. And of course, it was well braced. You know, it was a, a very heavy duty tower. And those cables that came down were about yay big around, and there was there were three sets of cables from each, like I said, from each side. And 
of course, there was this, this big concrete slab. And afterward, and we were allowed to, well, a couple of us sort of ran over toward the, this was a month afterward. And we were inside the 300 rad line, but we didn't spend very much time there. And it was interesting because here's the concrete slab, but it's all glassed over on the top, just melting. And where there was all this steel, uh, there wasn't. There was just little stubs of, of, of uh, metallic spots in the concrete where the, the base of the tower had been. And that's all. And then we went out, we would go out where the, on the three sides where they had these tower, the uh, cables come down. And you could see that big concrete block that was buried. And then there would be some stubs of, uh, stubs of iron bar come out. And they, they were about yay big around that the cables were attached to. And that was all. So the, the metal that was there wasn't anymore. Well, again, it was vaporized. So that's got to be awfully hot, isn't it? Around how many tests did you witness? Um, well, of course, we were able from way back to witness our test. And then I was out, I think I was out in, uh, in the trenches. We just, I, I volunteered for this because it was interesting. So I think I was out there for three different shots in the trenches. I can't tell you which ones. But they were out. They were 500-foot towers, kind of like we had in Frenchman Flat. And they were out there in Yucca Flat. So there would be, I guess, four. And then, of course, the, the smoke screen or the smoke ring at, uh, at 100,000, all of us saw that. So we witnessed it, but we were a long ways away, and we were at ground level. How was morale before the shots? Before the, like, uh, how was, like, the morale at the camp? How what were the soldiers feeling? Well, you know, th this, this is very interesting. You ask a good question. I think the, the, the military folks, the folks that were in our battalion, we were the biggest unit there, by the way, because we had about, oh, 480 people or so in a battalion. We had three companies and a four co headquarters company. And then we had a, a small military police group. We had the, uh, we call them the blue, the blue flag boys, or single corps from, uh, uh, from the signal base. And they were the ones that, that put up all the warning areas and they, uh, uh, I guess you'd call it, they identified the areas where we were supposed to go behind. Uh, but you know, it's kind of funny because I, I don't remember people being all concerned. Gee, are we going to be blown away? Are we going to turn or turn into vegetables or what? I didn't hear any of that. You know, we were just concerned about the things we had to do. And oh yeah, and I got to lay this one on you. One of the shots, and I can't remember which one, but it was one out there in uh, Yucca Flat. We had, and it was, and of course, this was part of the Army, you know. We had 38 generals showed up, including uh, four-star Matthew Ridgeway. And they all showed up. And two of us, second lieutenants, I hadn't made first yet, were considered to be, we were detached, and we were the, uh, the aides for these 38 generals. And so they had a bunch of little trailers there. And so the generals started coming in, and we had to take them to their particular trailer. And it's kind of interesting. That's the first time I'd ever been around a general. And man, we had 38 of them, two of us, to worry about. So our job was that they were there for a particular shot. And so our job was when, when the AEC said, OK, tomorrow we're going to try it. Now, they had to wait till the wind conditions were just right, the temperature conditions were just right. And again, all of these shots were dawn. It wasn't full light. So we would have to get the generals up, run around there and bang on, General, sir, General, sir, it's time for chow, time for chow. <laughs> and we're running around, two of us, banging on all these trailers, trying to get these generals up and at them. So they'd come pouring out and they'd go to the mess hall. We had one huge metal mess hall. The rest were tents and trailers. <clears throat> so we'd get them fed, come back, and we'd put them on buses. Now, there was generally, I think we had two buses. And out we'd go to the forward area. And, and of course, their shot was a shot out at Yucca Flat. It wasn't the one, the one we did at uh, Frenchman Flat. So we'd get them out there. Well, would you believe 
that we had to wake up the generals, get them on a bus, get them fed, get them on a bus, get them out to, to Yucca Flat five times before the, because the shot would, would, some, it would be called off sometime after we'd gotten them up. And we had to turn the buses around one time, but there was six, uh, four times we actually got out there. And so, and, and they were, you know, the, the, the generals were, were in back in the, back in the, in the, in the uh, I guess you'd call it the, the concrete, pardon me, the concrete bunkers. So it was the fifth time that they went out that they were able to set the thing off. And, and by then we didn't have 38 generals, we had about 12. They, you know, they just couldn't wait around that long. You know, we did that in about th three weeks. So, so we had our general shot, and of course I was involved in that too. I and my my colleague, who was the other second lieutenant, who was was the aide of the generals. So, what was your direct job during that shot, other than getting the generals up and ready to I'm go? I'm sorry, say again. What was your main job, other than making sure their generals were ready? Well, the one. In Frenchman Flat, where we had done all that work, and the AEC had built their little little town on the other side, town on the other side, was basically just observing it, and so we were back up there, and we were two miles away, so we didn't even have to be in in trenches. But by the same token, though, everybody was supposed to look away, and there there weren't enough of those dark glasses for us to all have glasses, because our uh, they didn't take the whole battalion out; they took our company, see, my company commander, us three platoon leaders, and I think we took uh, probably three or four senior NCOs from each, each platoon, because there just wasn't room to haul everybody out there. So that was that one. Then, of course, the ones where we went as, as uh, troops down in the, you know, the slots and the, and the uh, uh, trenches. Uh, we, of course, we didn't look at the thing when it happened. We were able to see what happened when, you know, when they, the, the light was all finished and the back blast had occurred. So we could just stand up and look out over the edge of the, tr of the uh, trench. And, of course, that one that was that, that aerial shot, I mean, way up in the air, we were just standing around looking, you know, we're, I don't know, we're probably 45 or 50 miles south of where it actually happened and it was a hundred thousand feet in the air or so so that was that was how they normally oh and i have to one more thing that i thought was interesting uh what's now fort Irwin is camp Irwin, and that's north of barstow and that's the uh the armored that's an armored post and that's where they bring tank or armored units in and then they have local people on site that have, at that time, they had uh, Russian and uh, I guess Chinese. They had, they had armor that was from our potential enemies. And then they would act as aggressors. And then, so they were training our, our, our troops, our, our uh, armored troops. Well, what happened was one of the shots in, at Yucca Flat and I can't remember which one, the army uh, brought up a company of tanks from Fort Irwin. And they ran those things overland. They didn't bring them on trailers. Now that's got to be 250 miles anyway. And you don't run tanks on pavement because they tear it up. So those poor guys and those tankers, they had to come all the way up from then Camp Irwin to Yucca Flat. And they came up to near Baker, and it was all overland, came up near Baker, they went through Ibex Pass, which Charlie Company had been down widening, not the highway, but the, the river bank, well, the Ibex Pass, so the tanks could come up and not have to go on the, on the uh, pavement. So these, those guys drove those tanks all the way up, wore out, I don't know how many sets of treads. And so their shot, what they were supposed to do, after that particular shot, 
and we called it the tank shot. But we weren't involved at all, of course, because you know we were combat engineers. We weren't tankers. But they were to go, once the shot was over, they were to button up the tanks, seal them up as best as they could, and then run them around, you know, just randomly run them around the area of that particular shot. I guess they wanted to find out, can you run a tank where they've set off an atomic bomb? I have no idea what it was all about, but we thought it was kind of ridiculous because they wore out a company of tanks. You know, you just don't put them on the ground. You don't run them on the ground that far. You put them on trailers and haul them. So I remember that. That was kind of unique. Um, what, 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 what was like in Oh, you mean living at the camp? Yeah. Well, actually, compared to like overseas and combat conditions, it was great. Nobody was shooting at us. And we junior officers had what they call Nissan huts, and they were made out of plywood, and they had plastic windows, and they had uh, uh, like plywood floors, and they had, uh, let's see, we had... We had 16 people in there, in, you know, bunks, and they had an open area in the middle, and fortunately for wintertime, they had a, uh, an oil heater, which heated the, 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 these were our barracks, and then, of course, when the generals weren't there, the upper level, you know, the folks that were like majors and above, they got to stay in the little trailers, of course, they were crummy trailers, they had two people per trailer, and then the only thing we had, the only permanent buildings we had at Camp Desert Rock was one big butler metal mess hall. And we had a small uh, infirmary. I mean, it was where the, uh, we had a, a medical detachment there so that if somebody cut themselves, they could go to get their finger bandaged or whatever. Or if they fell off a tower, then they could haul the corpse in there to be, oh, you know what I'm saying. That was a fermented building, and then we had uh, uh, had a, a, a theater which was wooden metal up so high that it was all tent. And I'll never forget. We had uh, Tony Arden and her group, and they were, you know, she's a singer, dancer, and we had them out for a show, and so we had all the. There was enough room for the, the troops for this show, and. and and the problem was that night a big wind came up, and so the the uh, the girls, the dancing girls, and so forth, are up on the stage, and we're all sitting down here in the chairs, and all of a sudden all the wind starts blowing, and the roof blew off. <laughs> These poor gals, all the all the stuff that was on the stage was blowing away. <laughs> so we got they got that fixed, but I'll never forget Tony Arden, and she was a nice lady, I guess, and she. Uh, she took it like a tiger. She did not blow away, fortunately. And so uh, the food was good. You know, when I was in the Army, I was always hungry. I went back for seconds. People said, I don't like Army chow. Well, listen, when you're hungry and you've been working out there in the front area from, say, 7.30 in the morning until dark and then six days a week, you know, you're hungry. And so the, uh, uh, the mess hall would handle probably... Oh, geez, they could put 150 people. It was a huge building. Then they had two metal latrines, you know, restrooms, where you could shower and do all that. And fortunately, where our little, little Nissan hut was, there was, I think, seven lieutenants we had. Uh, and some of us by then had made first lieutenant. And we had a couple of captains in our, in our little Nissan hut. And so fortunately, the closest latrine was only about 50 yards and we had a concrete walkway out there. And I can remember getting up in the morning and we'd have to run out there and shave, you know, and all so forth. And so we're, we're, it was okay in the fall, it was okay great in the spring, but in the middle of winter, I can remember being in a heck of a hurry and all I got is my jockey shorts on and a t-shirt and I'm running out there to get to the latrine so I could shave, you know, and be prepared and then come back to the, Rather than hauling clothes out, I'd run out there, shave, run back to the barracks, and then get dressed, and then we'd have to have our morning formation. So actually, I mean, the conditions weren't bad. The food was good. They, oh, they had a little PX 
there, a little PX tent, you know, post exchange, so you could buy shaving cream and, uh, and then they had a, one end of it, it was a little beer hall. And so you could go over for a beer, and this was mostly for the, mostly for the uh, enlisted folks. And then one of the things that Baker Company built with all this leftover material from the construction was an officer's club uh, with, you know, with timbers left over and with this, uh, uh, I guess you'd call it the corrugated metal that they used for some of the, some of the underground bunkers. They got that built for the officers. But I'll never forget, they brought a bunch of Marines in. Oh, there was probably a company of Marines. And they came in and we had put all these tents up and the Marines came in. And uh, my platoon sergeant was a, a guy named Jack Walker and he was a master sergeant and a great guy. He's, he broke me in. You know, when you're a lieutenant, you have to have a sergeant to teach you what to do. So he was a very good, he, he, he taught me well. Uh, and so, but he had a little side job. He was the bartender. I mean, he was the guy at the beer hall part of the PX. And he said, the night these Marines all came in and they all, you know, they were lined up. They came off buses. They put them in their tents. And he says, that place was like a Wild West saloon. These jarheads, that's what he called them, they were tossing down the beer and they were, and a fight would break out and we'd call the MPs because they had a small MP group there and the MPs would come charging in and, you know, they'd haul a guy, you know, they'd haul him out. I guess they had a little temporary place to put the guys that weren't behaving. So, and then another fight would break out and then Jack would have to get on the phone and call them, call the MPs and they'd haul the guys out. And he said, finally, it was getting time to close down and there was, it was calming down. They'd had their fights and they'd had their, and he said, he looked up and here's this high school kid in a Marine unit, a Marine Corps you know, just a high school kid, looked like a high school kid. And he came up to the bar and he had a big cut over his eye. Now there weren't any fights going on, but he was left over with blood coming down. And he says, can I have another beer, Sarge? And he was telling us, and we're all laughing like, like gangbusters. So there were some funny things that happened then too. Uh, the food was good. Uh, we had enough bunks. We had, in other words, it was well set up. And for, for field duty, I've had a lot worse. So it was, a, it was good. It was a good experience. Um, and, and what did you do after uh, your time at Camp Desert Rock? I'm sorry? What, what, what did you do in the Army after your time at Camp Desert Rock? Or after the shots? Yep. Well, well our shot, you know, and we were the Frenchman shot. Uh, we, some of us were there to just, you know, part of the unit was there. They couldn't haul the whole, the whole uh, battalion up there. So we were way back two miles away and we were able to, to see the thing. And so it was, it was another week before we could get up there back to Frenchman Flat to, to, to clean up. And, and you know, then they had some professional observers from Fort Belvoir, which was the Army Engineer Center back, you know, back near Washington, D.C. That's where we, brand new second lieutenants, took our basic officer training course. And, and I'd had that already, of course. So, uh, so there were some, some professional uh, observers that came out and they were crawling over these areas. And then as far as as we GIs, uh, we were there until they finished. The, I mean, the, the, our unit was there until they finished the last shot, and it, and basically we were cleaning up the campsite. And Baker Company, so we had three: had Abel, Charlie, Abel, Baker, and Charlie. Baker Company was in charge of our utilities. Okay, now here's this place out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and it turned out that, that there was enough underground water up at, up at uh, Mercury, that right up against the foothills before you went over to Freshman Flat. They had enough water there, but we, they tried putting a well down a couple of years before. And they couldn't, in the middle of the, of the valley where we were, there was no water. 
So they had a big water tank they'd put in. And so we had, we were hauling, uh, the Army tankers were hauling water from uh, Indian Springs uh, Air Force Base. They had water there. That was about 40 miles back toward Las Vegas. So these trucks were going back and forth and pumping water into this tank. And that was water for, for, our, for our use at the tank. I mean, at the, the, uh, the camp. And then the uh, Baker Company also had, they were responsible for what they called a uh, Imhoff tank, which is like a great big septic tank. And that took care of the wastewater. And then we had a power plant there so we could have power. And so the, the purpose of, uh, I mean, the, the mission of, of Baker Company was maintaining these infrastructure. And they did a good job. So like, you know, it was very comfortable compared to other field conditions. Uh, so, and we were there, let's see, the last shot, I'm going to guess, had to be in mid-May. Matter of fact, interestingly enough, <laughs> that's where I met my wife. And I was dating a young lady that was working for Bonanza Airlines in the maintenance department for a couple of three weeks. And so we, uh, after the Hell Dorado Day Parade, that was a big deal in Las Vegas in those days. I mean, they had, well, they had, it was a whole week. The last Sunday was the big parade. And uh, so we had to, uh, my boss, my company commander says, okay, you went to college, you were a college puke, you take some of the better sergeants, you go build, build a float because they're, they're having a military division. So Nellis Air Force Base had a float, uh, Indian Springs Air Force Base had a float, Camp Desert Rock had a float, there was a Navy underwater demolition group down at Lake Mead and they had a float, and so that was the purpose. So. My girlfriend rode around in my Jeep. I mean, I had guys on the float that we built, but uh, they were right in the float. And I was just, you know, going, look, coming in from the side streets to make sure the boys on the float weren't making too much, too many, you know, uh, yahoos and whistles at, at the girls on the parade, you know. Uh, so after I said, oh, let's get married. Okay, let's get married. So we got married that night. You could do that in Nevada. I had just turned 23, she just turned 22. Took me two weeks before I had enough guts to call home and tell my folks I got married. That and then uh, Ginger Ginger had been married a week before. This is my sister-in-law, and so the two late girls had moved out of the the place where the her folks were living, and so my wife shows up the next morning, and her mother says, "Oh, you didn't come home." She says, "Yeah, I got married." She says, I hope it was her, because you know, I'd been going there and her mom was a good cook. I could get a that's how I got a good home cooked meal once in a while. And so her stepfather said, Holy mackerel, they're both the girls are gone. Now I can get into the bathroom in the morning. So anyway, that was a res that was a response we got on both sides of this. Well, uh, my wife passed away four years ago. We'd been married almost 61 years. So a actually, I guess that's the way to do it, isn't it? Are you planning on doing it that way? <laughs> okay, any more questions or something? I think you actually answered all the questions. You answered all the questions. I mean, we got them all answered? Yeah. Is, is there anything else you wanted to say? Well, let me see if I can think of something else weird that might have happened. Well... I won't tell you his last name, but Byron was a, a first lieutenant. I made first lieutenant by then. Uh, Byron was the company, com uh, uh, yeah, Baker Company commander. And we were kind of buddies because I was like the senior first lieutenant there at that time, you know, having had that enlisted time. He was single, I was single. I ended up getting married just a month before we left there. Byron stayed single. He was older than I by probably... Oh, I don't know, four or five years anyway. And I don't know if I ought to say this, but I'm going to tell you anyway, because I think it's pretty funny. There was a place called Ash Meadows 
Y'all know about ash meadows? Okay, it's a wildlife preserve up in Ambergosa Valley. And at that time, Highway 95, of course, was there, and it went from Vegas on up toward Reno, went right by Camp Desert Rock and by Mercury. And so you could get to Ash Meadows. It was down in the Amargosa Valley, not the Pahrump Valley. That's Amargosa is the valley just east of Death Valley, and then the Pahrump Valley is the next one. Then you got the Charleston Mountains, and then you got the Vegas Valley. So this Ash Meadows also had a retreat. And I guess a lot of politicians and other types of folks went there. And it was like a big motel that had a pool. And Byron had a girlfriend that worked down there, so he would climb in his car and drive out uh, toward, past the turnoff to Pahrump, the turnoff to Amargosa Valley, and it was a gravel road that went all the way down to Ash Meadows. And he'd drive down there for the weekend every once in a while. And so we'd get him. We'd say, Byron, you know, that's an awful long ways for your girlfriend to get to your girlfriend. He says, well, yeah, but I got a girlfriend. How about you guys? Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. So uh, let's see. That was, I thought that was kind of funny. Um, oh. I told you about the Marines that came in and the, and the, and the young Marine that wanted another beer, Sarge. Uh, let's see, what did we have? Oh, and we told you about when Tony Arden uh, got, got, got exposed to a Camp Desert Rock windstorm um, and, and the generals that showed up. Well, I don't know. I guess that probably took care of about all the oddball things I can think about. But it was, you know, I'll tell you what, that was a highlight of my, 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 uh, my army, my three-year army career, or active duty career. Well, you know, and I got a pretty nice wife out of Henderson. She grew up in Henderson. Well, well thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Well, it's an, a pleasure being here. You know, I like this place. Well, thank you. And, of course, it gave me a chance to begin to have some pretty good memories that I'd sort of forgotten about. And thank you very much, Ben. You did a really good job as an interviewer. Thank you. You might want to figure out that as maybe a, you can you know, be on TV and be one of those interviewers. You have to have a beautiful blonde sitting next to you, though, if you, if you take that. <laughs>